All right, good to go. All right, thanks. thanks. So just to start out a, a little history, uh, seeds have been saved since the beginning of agriculture. Um, th this isn't a new concept, even though sometimes it feels like it's a new concept these days, um, but it, it's gone on you know, for, again, since the beginning of agriculture. You know, an, an early good example uh, would be Joseph, who was sold into Egypt in the Bible. And, you know, when, when he was in, in Egypt, um, you know, he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams to say that there's going to be some famine that's going to come. And so what we're going to do is we're going to save grain seeds so that when there's times of famine, uh, we can distribute those grain seeds. And so there's, you can see, you know, examples of seed saving throughout uh, history if you look for them. Uh, a really good example of a seed saver, maybe before that we'll talk about this, this picture right here. Uh, this is from the Chelsea Physic Garden in London, uh, which is a really unique uh, garden there in London. It was started by the physicians and they would grow their medicines and their herbs there, but it was another great example of, you know, seed saving that's gone on. You know, the, the plaque there is from 1686, uh, you know, so going back, you know, long, long times, uh, seed saving has a history. And it has a history for every time except modern times is the weird thing. Every culture, every people saved their own seeds. And now it's becoming this thing where we expect big corporations or, or geneticists to be the only ones that can save seeds for us, which is complete is a complete mess. Right. And we'll, we'll show later on how, how easy and simple it really is to save seeds. And it's not complicated at all. Uh, you know, a great example that I really like is uh, Nikolai Ivanovich Vavilov. Uh, he was a Russian botanist and geneticist and agronomist. Uh, and, you know, many consider him to be one of the greatest seed savers. And he, he set out on a, a mission to try to solve hunger and starvation. And so what he did is he went all over the world and, and learned about the origins of seeds, learned about the plants, how they were adapted to the local environments and climates and in the process collected you know somewhere in the range of 250,000 to 360,000 different seeds roots fruits uh, from from everywhere uh, and these were stored in a seed bank in St. Petersburg uh, and he came up with this concept known as the Vavilov centers of origin and and really looked at you know where certain varieties of plants originated uh, in in the world now, unfortunately, uh, he, he lived in a time uh, when there was world war was going on. And one of the, the more interesting unknowns about Vavilov and his seed library, or his seed bank really, uh, is that one of the, the main reasons why Adolf Hitler invaded Russia was he wanted to get control of Vavilov's seed collection. Hitler knew that if you could control the food, you could weaponize it and you could control people that way. And so Hitler wanted to get his hands on this vast, vast collection of seeds in order to feed everybody within the Third Reich. Um, another unfortunate thing for Vavilov was he was a very strong believer in science and Mendelian genetics, which did not agree with the, the prevailing thinking of Joseph Stalin and the uh, Soviet party at that time. And Vavilov was very vocal about believing in science and scientific principles. And it landed him, eventually in 1941, it landed him in prison. Uh, and, and during this whole time, he was in prison while uh, St. Petersburg and Russia is being invaded by the Nazis. There was a, a special squadron of the SS that was assigned to find that seed library and to take it over. Fortunately, it was hidden and they never found it, uh, partly due because of where it was located and partly because there were a lot of Vavilov's uh, work colleagues and people who worked for him that swore to protect it. Uh, and, and some of the seeds, you know, that they were, you know, regular seeds that you could store and they would be fine, but they had a, a lot of collection, like I said, of roots and tubers and things like that that had to be grown out. So during, you know, the time when the Nazis are invading and there's war raging all over, these people that worked for Vavilov would, under the cover of night, go out and they would plant the, as an example, the potatoes. They would plant the potatoes to be able to grow out the potato seeds so they wouldn't rot in the collection. And then they would go harvest them, collect them, and bring them back in. Many of those people actually died of starvation, as did many people in Russia during that time. But they died of starvation protecting Vavilov's seed collection, knowing how important that seed collection was and, and what it meant to the world. They couldn't let it, number one, fall into the hands of the Nazis, but also couldn't eat it and consume it, which could have saved them. But they, they saw the importance of how great it was that uh, you know they gave their lives to protect it. 
and then, you know, as, as mentioned, you know, sadly, Vavilov uh, was arrested, put in prison in 1941, and was sentenced to death. Uh, his, his sentence was commuted to 20 years in prison. However, unfortunately, in 1943, he died of the very thing he was trying to solve, and that was starvation. Um, Gary Nadpen wrote a, a really great book about Vavilov. Uh, it's called Where Our Food Comes From. So if you're interested in learning more about him, and his story, um, I highly recommend that book. It's a fantastic book. So why save seeds for your seed library? And I put a picture, a bad picture of me here um, because of the location. It's, this is uh, William Shakespeare's wife, Anne Hathaway's house that she grew up in. And um, just the, uh, the amazing amount of diversity that's in that garden and the seed saving that goes on in those kinds of places. So um, why? Well, first of all, one of the big important things to many of us is that then we're adapting seeds to the local climate, the local area. So as we do that, we, um, we're making it so that it's more resistant to climate change, to our local conditions, so that we have these seeds that, can, that we know have the best chance of success where we live. Also, it's no, there's no need to go buy more or ask for seeds. Um, from seed companies, like we all do with seed libraries, where we get we need um, to bulk up more seeds, um, it eliminates that. It helps share with fellow gardeners. It creates the sense of community, which I love. That people get excited about what they're saving, um, the stories that go with it. Especially, it becomes this community um, um, cohesion that happens. And I put that also in the resiliency because because it preserves these heritages, these stories about things, the stories as far back as we can get them, because a lot of these seeds aren't ours, right? A lot of these seeds have come from generations and generations and cultures before us. So figuring out these stories as far as far back as we can and saving those just really creates this amazing thing. It also creates um, this resilience uh, when we're talking about food seeds, this resiliency of security for our, our local communities. We have a, food sense, a sense of abundance and of, of security when we have these seeds um, in our local area. Also to preserve the genetic diversity and Steve will talk about here in a second, but um, a lot of that, those commercial varieties of vegetable seeds have just gone down to very few. Um, we're not sure how many, but a couple different articles say anywhere from 90 to 96% of Vegetable seeds, we just don't know where they are um, or they've disappeared. And then down there is a link and I will put my slides somewhere for Rebecca to, or I'll probably put them in the, the upbeat seed thing so that you can get this link. But on our on our Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance's YouTube site, there's a great thing about glass gymmed corn and it's a great poster child for saving seeds in communities. And that background picture is some of the, the beautiful glass gym corn. So like, like Jackie mentioned, you know, there's been a number of studies looking at uh, the loss of, of diversity of, of a lot of these seeds. This is one of the uh, more, more popular studies that gets cited. Uh, this, is, this is from uh, back in the 80s. So it's a little bit old, so I'll, I'll just give it with that caveat. But what they did is they went and they looked at commercial seed catalogs in 1903 and then compared them to the seed catalogs available in 1983 and then looked at you know, the diversity of, of the different crops that were there. So if you just take as an example, um, let's look at the, the beets. I'm always amazed when I look at this one, 288 varieties of beets. I didn't know that there were that many varieties of beets out there, but in 1903, looking at the seed catalogs, there were 288 varieties of beets that you could purchase. Um, fast forward to 1983, there's only 17 varieties. Now, that doesn't mean that these varieties have gone extinct or anything like that. In some cases, it could mean that. But in many cases, you know, they're no longer available for purchase. They could be found in, in family seed collections. Uh, they could be found in university seed collections, but they weren't available to the public to be able to purchase and to incorporate into their gardens uh, or seed libraries. Fortunately, you know, we've seen a shift over, you know, the last 40 years since the, this study was published that, you know, more and more you're seeing some of these varieties come back into the seed catalogs. There's more access to them. I haven't personally gone through and counted you know, these, but, um, you know, just looking at the various seed catalogs, you know, I think a lot of the diversity has started to come back in large part because of, of, of individuals like yourselves running seed libraries and trying to get seeds in the hands of people. Go for it. Yeah. <clears throat> this is just another study, a little bit more recent, not too much still, 
that um, where they're saying 90% of the crop varieties have disappeared from farmers' fields. So it's almost like um, we are the ambassadors, right, for these seeds. It's our mission to get these back in the hands of the growers, not just the farmers, but the gardeners, the backyard gardeners. I mean, that's, that's just amazing that we can be part of that. So the, the question, you know, comes in, how many seeds can you get from, from one plant or one fruit? And, and the answer really is a lot. Um, that's kind of the amazing thing about seeds is you plant one seed and you're going to get, depending upon the, the, the plant, the variety, anywhere from tens to dozens to hundreds to maybe even thousands of seeds just from that one seed. Uh, so it, it, it's amazing what you can get out of, you know, a single tomato. Um, you know, I, I've done some where I've taken tomatoes and counted them and, and they've been anywhere from, you know, 100 to 300 seeds in one tomato. Uh, and that's just, you know, you think about being able to take that and, um, you know, you basically have a lifetime supply of tomato seeds out of one tomato uh, for all you'd ever need. And then, you know, you can share those tomato seeds with others and they can plant that and have that same experience. And, you know, before you know it, you know, everybody's growing these beautiful tomatoes. Um, so that's just, the, the, you know, to me, a really cool thing about seeds and plants. All right, we're going to pause for a second. I think we have some hands up. Do we want to really quick um, answer any questions that might have sprung up? Uh, Don, do you want to start? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Oh, all right. Well, um, maybe hands are still up from when we were talking about if we have experience or not. So if you don't have a quick, if anybody else has a quick question, they'd like to either put in the chat or just unmute really quick, go for it. Okay, I see a couple raised hands. Uh, Jocelyn, would you like to say your question? All right. We're going to keep going then. I'm not sure why I'm having this delayed response on my computer. Go for it. Okay. okay. No, that is you. So quick terminology uh, with, with seeds. Uh, we'll go through these. these, these you'll, you'll see these terms come up again and again and again as you get into seeds and seed saving. Uh, the first one is open pollinated. And, and as in the name would indicate, it means that it's kind of an uncontrolled pollination. It, you know, these, these types of plants are pollinated by the wind, they're pollinated by insects, by birds, by humans, by you know, a, a number of different means. And, and what that does is it allows for more of a, a free flow of genetic material. So you'll find a lot more genetic diversity in these open pollinated varieties. The other thing about open pollinated varieties is if you have controlled the pollination and you don't get any cross pollination, these will be your true two type plants. So you have a parent plant of a, let's say a, a great watermelon that you really like, and you've controlled the uh, pollination of that such that it hasn't crossed with anything else. That plant, that watermelon that you grow is going to be just like that parent watermelon. And will continue that way as long as you, you continue to ensure they don't get any cross pollination. Now that brings to the second one, cross pollinated. This is, um, can mean a couple of different things, but basically it's one plant pollinated another plant. Now there are some plants that require this. So you take uh, apples as an example, you know, there are some self pollinating apples where you don't have to have multiple varieties. And then there are varieties of apples where you do have to have multiple varieties of apples because one variety will pollinate a different variety, but they don't pollinate themselves. Um, cross pollination also occurs, you know, in, in a lot of these open pollinated plants. So for example, you plant a zucchini plant, and you plant a crook neck squash plant next to each other, and you save the seeds from those, that next year you're gonna plant them, you might get some funky crosses. Um, you might get a crook neck that's not yellow, but green, like a zucchini, or you get a, a zucchini that's half green and half yellow. Um, these aren't necessarily bad things. Um, I, I like to garden and grow things because I like to eat. And in my opinion, if it tastes good, that's a win. Um, now, if we're trying to keep you know, the genetic lines pure for these uh, seed libraries so that we can ensure that it's going to be that way, then we don't want that to happen. Uh, but if it happens in your garden, you know, who cares? As long as it tastes good, uh, that's all that matters. Uh, GMO, transgenic, you know, these are uh, unnatural engineering of, of organisms. So you may be putting in the genes from 
an insect so that a corn plant produces a particular toxin that's toxic to insects that can infest it, or you are inputting genes into a plant that make it resistant to uh, herbicides that get sprayed on it, so you can spray the whole field with an herbicide, kill all the weeds, but that plant survives. Uh, typically, we don't encounter those types of seeds. You know, those are really reserved and sold to the really large farms who have contracts, because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's a way to sell more pesticides, sell more herbicides, and and you know, home gardeners uh, really aren't the target market for this. So you, you're not going to see these seeds show up in your seed libraries. Um, heirloom, heirloom just means it's an open pollinated variety that has a history attached to it. So all heirlooms are open pollinated, but not all open pollinated varieties are heirlooms. Um, a good example of it, and, I, and I, I can't remember the name of it, but it, I think it's in, in one of the Carolinas, there's a particular bean that on one side of the county line has a name and a history, and on the other side of the county line has a different name and history, but it's the same bean genetically. So you'll, you'll see a lot of these heirloom varieties have these really great stories that are attached to them. Um, land race varieties, these are your, your local, varieties that are improved by traditional methods. It, it's kind of like a, a manifestation of evolution where you're taking this variety and you're really putting it on your land and you're gonna cultivate it for many, many years. It becomes adapted to the, the soil conditions on your land. It's adapted to the climate conditions there. Uh, these, are, these are the land race. And these aren't just limited to plants. Um, you know, there are a lot of land race animal varieties as well. And then lastly is hybrid. Um, these are um, where you take in, you can take maybe you start with two open pollinated varieties and you start to cross them because you like the uh, characteristics of one and you like the characteristics of another and you want to try to put them into one variety that has those same characteristics and has all of those. Um, these ones, you can save seeds from hybrids. Uh, the danger in doing that is when you plant them, they may or may not be true to the parent. So you got this great hybrid honeydew melon, let's say, and you really like the flavor of it. You like some of the, the, the characteristics of it. You save seeds from that and you plant them. You may get that same melon the next year. You may not. You may get the, one of the parents that come out of it. And so that's the danger with saving seeds from hybrids. Now you can take a hybrid seed and you can breed the hybridization out of it. It takes about eight generations to do so. And then you'll be left with a, a variety that now will be more true to the parent. Uh, but it's not going to be true to that variety that you first started with. Doesn't mean that they're necessarily sterile also. I think there's an assumption that hybrid means sterile. And there are sterile varieties of hybrid, uh, but there are also non-sterile varieties of hybrids as well. All right. And just a little bit, too, about uh, patented seeds uh, and seed libraries and how that works. Um, if you didn't get a chance, listen to Bill McDormand's um, talk when it comes back on as recorded. Uh, last hour, he gave a great one on that. That'll give you some, in case you do in, um, ever encounter some um, patented seeds that are donated to your seed library. So let's just talk about some mechanics of saving a few seeds. Um, these are some easy varieties to try, um, especially as you're starting out. And this is the list of the ones we're going to go over fairly quickly. So if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat. Francis will be keeping an eye on that because she's wonderful like that. And then um, we'll be talking about three different methods. And these methods can be used for ones beyond even the ones we're going to talk about. But it's, it's um, proven, method, proven ways to get these going, and, and we'll put those categories in there. We'll put those varieties in each of these categories. All right, so the dry method. Easy. Mother Nature's doing the work with this one for sure. Um, you allow the seed pods to dry on the plant, and then you harvest them. Then you pull the plant out of the ground and you hang it upside down to dry just in case it's not completely dry. And then, um, then you pick the paws up and dry in the rack. So if you live somewhere like we do, we live in the Flagstaff, Arizona, and it's, um, we're at 7,000 feet. So it is cold. Our growing season is only guaranteed to not have a freeze for about 60 to 70 days. So a lot of us, when we think of things that we need to dry, sometimes we have to pull them out of the ground. So Steve made me racks like this for um, a lot of my beans and herbs. Um, where I can I can get airflow underneath, keep a single layer, and then get the beans to dry right there in the pod, um, and then then it's fine if I have to pull them from plants. A lot of you probably have that same problem with frost. So you can do this with many of the herbs, lettuces. We'll talk more about that, and root vegetables, and many of the flowers too. Just let them um, dry either on a rack like that or on the ground. 
or in plant. And you do it with peppers and chilies too, is one way. You just let the pepper chili just dry up on the plant and then save the seed. Yeah. And so lettuce, just really quick. Lettuce sometimes frightens people because it, you're all are familiar with when your lettuce bolts. It gets hot in the summer, your lettuce starts to bolt. And we all get a little bit um, sad, like, oh, that's the end of that nice tasting lettuce because then it comes a little becomes a little bitter when it's but it's also think of it as a positive thing now that you're running the seed library because now it's time to collect those seeds and and it has a new purpose that bolted lettuce but people get nervous when they see this because they see all that fluff and they think oh those seeds are so tiny and there's all the fluff and where's the seed um it really doesn't have to be that scary really what i do is i take those i get a ziploc bag and i take all those little fluffy seed heads that are now dry and um and um, that's just the that's just the wind disperser, right? The the parachute, the fluffy parachute on the top. So take those seeds heads, cut them all off, put them in a Ziploc bag, and just kind of gently break it apart. And those and the um, umbels on the top will fall away, and then lightly blow them out of your bag. It's great because it just comes up on your face, so you can find a different way if you don't like that, or if you're afraid you might have an allergic reaction. Um, but the seeds will be just they're heavier, and so they will be in the bottom of your Ziploc bag. They're not that hard at all. Beans, I sit there and with the dry pods as I watch TV and just break apart the beans. The other thing you can do, and a lot of people do this when you have a, a large amount, is just put them in a tarp, step on them, and it'll break them apart in their pods. And then um, again, you blow away the chaff, you blow away the, the seed husk around it, and you are you left with your bean seeds. And same with peas. Do you want to do herbs? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go through this whole list. But it's kind of the same as the lettuce. You're cutting off the top heads. Um, my seed library volunteers, packaging volunteers, love it because I'll just bring either paper towels or Ziploc bags with all of the, the chaff and everything with the seeds. And then they are learning, right, about it as they go because the seeds are always are a little heavier than all of the detritus that's going to be in there. So we're breaking them up in Ziploc bags and they're blowing away um, until they get to the seeds that are at the bottom. And all those varieties do that. And, and grains are, are very similar and use that dry method. So those who are wanting to grow things like wheat and barley um, and other grains, um, you know, you let the, the seed heads dry out in the field, you harvest them, uh, and then, you know, you got to thresh and winnow them. And it's a similar process. You know, you're going to break them up, you're going to break up those husks and holes all around them, um, especially the holeless varieties. Um, hulled varieties, you have to do, it takes a little bit more work because you got to separate the hole. It's a little harder to do. Um, but, you know, if you're growing a holeless barley as an example, same type of thing as Jackie described with the uh, beans, you know, you, you put them in a tarp, cover it up, stomp on it, and then you're going to take those and then, um, you know, use like a box fan or something like that to blow away all that chaff that's left over. And then you're left with these nice grains and you can mill them and, and make bread out of them, which is what we like to do. All right, so semi-wet method, uh, you know, kind of as it sounds, would be, you know, things like your, your melons, your pumpkins, and those sorts of things that, you know, when the, the fruit itself is, is ripe and ready to be harvested and eaten, the seeds are also ready too. So you, you take, uh, you know, this, this picture up on the top here, this is a, a Hubbard squash, and you're going to scoop out those seeds, and you can rinse them out underneath the, the you know, faucet to, to wash them off a little bit, get some of the the stringy material it's all attached to them the slime off of them but then you're just going to spread them out and let them dry and, and it can take a number of weeks you want to make sure that they're completely dry so when you go to store them you don't get any moisture in there so you get molds or anything like that but it's pretty simple and straightforward um, like we said you're just going to scoop them out and then you're going to dry them out um, with watermelons you know we all love to spit watermelon seeds and so you can spit them the farthest but same thing you know as you spit them out collect them on your plate and set them out to dry and you'll have, you know, watermelon seeds. <laughs> peppers, same thing. You know, we said that one, one way of doing peppers is, you know, you can use the dry method where you just let them dry on the plant. Uh, the thing with peppers is you want to make sure they've turned color. That's an indicator of the fact that their seeds are ready. So if you've got, what's that? Maturity. Maturity, yeah. Um, you know, if you've got like a, uh, you know, jalapeno or something like that, you know, a lot of times we harvest them when they're green to be eaten, but you want to make sure that jalapeno turns red so that you've got um, enough 
maturity in those seeds to continue. Yeah, go get my bag downstairs. Uh, we mentioned melons and talked about melons uh, for the semi-wet method. Uh, these are some melons that we've we've grown ourselves uh, here in Flagstaff. Um, this is a you know, a watermelon variety that I really really like. It's called Alibaba. It comes from Iraq, and it's very accustomed to arid climates like like we have here in Arizona, and and does really really well with a short growing season. Um, and that brings us into the wet method. And, and the wet method is it, again. It's a little bit more involved than the other methods we talked about, but again, very simple and, and not hard to do. Um, and essentially what you're going to do is this is for seeds that are um, developed in a more wet environment. So you think like your tomato seeds, you know, when you, when you harvest tomato seeds, you've got this like slimy jelly around the surface of them. And that really is to prevent them from starting to germinate in while well, they're, they're in a, a very wet environment inside the fruit. Um, and so what you're gonna have to do is remove that jelly from the seed. And by you're gonna, what you're gonna do is, is go through a fermentation process to do that. Hang on, I take a break really fast. I'm gonna plug in my computer, it's about to die. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now we're good. All right, sorry it's a busy that. morning around here, sorry. Saturdays with three kids becomes crazy. Okay, so what you're gonna do is, is we'll start with the tomatoes example. You can take those tomato seeds, you're gonna put them in a, a jar, and you're gonna cover it with water. And you're gonna sit that jar kind of in your windowsill so it gets some sunlight. You're gonna see this picture on the bottom right. You get this white film that's gonna form on top of that. And that's that's molds fungi that are starting to grow on top of it. That's a sign of the fermentation going on. Once you get to that point, you've, you've really fermented off that jelly around the seed. And so you're just gonna take uh, you know, a strainer or something like that, pour it through the strainer, rinse off the seeds, and set the seeds out to dry. One of the cool things that it does too is it also, because of this fermentation process, is that you know, it, it treats the seeds for any sort of seed-borne diseases. Um, and so you, you get a better guarantee of seed germination the, the following year. And this method is good for you know anything when you look at the seed it's got that kind of jelly coating around it so tomatoes cucumbers tomatillos um, you can also use a dry method for these uh, and as an example you could take you know, your cucumber seeds and it's a little bit more intensive but you can physically break up that jelly that's around them rinse that off under the sink and dry them um, i like this this wet method because it's very easy and simple and doesn't require a lot of work just put the seeds in a jar cover it with water set it out in the windowsill for a week to a week and a half and then you're good to go all right maybe we should pause because i'm sure there were questions because we went over a lot fast francis do you have any questions for us here yeah um the first question is somebody's wondering how to save tarragon seeds Oh, I, I meant to take that one off. That one is really tricky. You caught the hardest one. Uh, tarragon are actually, they don't go to sea very much, and a lot of times they say they're sterile. I've never tried uh, the French variety, um, but it's, uh, what was I going to say about it? it? It actually is hard to start it from seed, seed, and it's better to start it from division, and so I don't know. I've only ever grown the French variety. Well, no, that's yeah, wrong. I had the Russian variety before, and you can get that from seed, but they don't taste as well, and most people don't like it. Um, they, they're not as pungent. Um, so I guess all that to say, I don't know how to help you, except that when they dry, take the seeds off, and don't believe that it's sterile, and just try it and see. And if you get, try a germination test. We'll talk about it in a minute and see if it works. Um, but the French varieties, they say they're sterile. Just divide the plant. Divide the plant, that doesn't really help with the seed library. No. Um, but maybe that's something that could be part of your seed swap or part of a of a of an in-person experience with your seed library. Thank you, you guys. I have another question. How do you prevent cure cubits from crossing? <laughs> <laughs> that is the question, right? That's the hard one. Um, isolation. That's really the only way to do it. You can either make it so that they're not that pollinators are not getting there and making them cross or you can keep them farther away from each other 
they recommend, a lot of people recommend like a quarter of a mile, which most of us don't have that much room to grow. Um, so at our seed library, what I always hope and recommend is that people will grow their own separate varieties and then bring those seeds in. But I've had the worst happen. I've had the worst where things have crossed, they've come in. People have told me later that they crossed and we survived it. It wasn't a big deal. People still were able to eat that. And then I went and got fresh seed, knowing that last year's seed was not true to parent. But about Thank you. That answer? <laughs> Thank you. I have a question about, um, do you filter your water when doing the wet seed saving method? No, we, we don't. Um, you know, most, most water that's, that's chlorinated, you know, as soon as it comes out of the tap, you know, within the first 20 minutes, a lot of that chlorine has, has gone into the vapor phase and it, it leaves the water. If you're really worried about it, you know, you can leave the water up for 24 hours uh, to, to let, you know, be sure that there's no chlorine left in it. Um, but, you know, we've always done it just straight out of the tap, right into the jar and haven't had any issues with it. Thank you. Um, so somebody said they have kale and collard greens bolting. Um, the pods look matured, but very green. When do you know when to pull the plant out of the ground? Should I stop watering it? Should I pick the leaves? And they live in Las Vegas where it's very dry. Very dry, very hot. So you're, you're out of your cold season crop. Just mm -hmm. let it wait for it to dry. Um, I wouldn't, I, you know, there's no need to pull it out of the ground. You can continue watering it. What you'll eventually see is those seed pods will start to turn, will start to dry and turn brown. And then at that point, that's when you can harvest them. I, I just let nature do it for you. Just like okay. a radish, but longer. So I, I have a few more questions. I'm not sure. Do you guys want to continue and take more questions at the end? Or should I give you a few more? Uh, yeah, let's do like three more and then we'll keep going and hopefully we'll have time for everyone to discuss because I bet there are people here that have great answers to these too. Perfect. Um, how long does it generally take to ferment with the wet method? It's like a, a week to a week and a half. Although I will say we've done things where we've just forgotten about them and let them go for months and they're still fine. They're still viable. viable. <laughs> like the recommendations are three to five days and I've gone like three to five months. months. Yeah. <laughs> and they've still been viable. So don't give up on this. People get intimidated by the wet method. Don't get, don't get intimidated. Mm -hmm. um, what is meant by sterile? Do sterile plants produce seeds? As I understand it, they're just treated, usually heat treated so that they can't uh, produce, but that that's not necessarily. A, the, well, and, and some of your hybrids like sterile does mean that they won't produce seeds. So you take like, for example, seedless watermelons, right? That's a sterile uh, hybrid. You know, there, there are no seeds to be saved from that, or even the seeds that do develop are these little flimsy things that, that don't have any genetic viability to be able to reproduce. But you notice like when you get those sterile watermelons, they still sometimes have a black seed in them. So yeah. it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's usually not 100%. Thank you. I'll give you guys one more. How long should seeds be spread out to dry in the dry method and after rinsing in other methods? Should they be dried on screens, wax paper, or what? Uh, you can dry them on a number of different surfaces. The one that that that, that I would say we, we've done and don't recommend is like paper towels because the seeds like to stick to them once they're dry. But you know, if you dry them out for our a couple of weeks to a month that's usually it, it, again it depends upon your climate you know so where we live in, in Arizona it's pretty arid uh, it's pretty dry um, they dry out pretty quickly if you're in a more humid environment you might need to let them sit out for a little bit longer it may take one to two months to get dry enough uh, but putting them on screens is a great uh, way to do it because you get airflow all around them so you get better drying and and towels for things that are like the little like your tomato seeds and I'm always overly cautious and leave them out for as long as I possibly can stand them being in the way and then roll them up and put them away. So as long as you can. But two weeks, yeah, minimum is what I would say. All Thank right, you guys. thanks Francis. Yep, go ahead. Yep, you're the best. All right, root vegetables. Uh, so your root vegetables are all biennials, which means they'll flower and produce seeds in the second year. Uh, and so what you need to do is for these guys, you're wanting to save seeds from overwinter them. So in areas where the, the winters aren't harsh and aren't overly cold and freeze the ground solid all the way through, 
you know, you could leave them in the ground, maybe apply a layer of mulch over them or something like that. And then uh, in the spring and, and following summer, then they'll start to flower and produce seeds. Uh, if you're living in a climate where it's a little bit more harsh outside in the winter time, what you can do is take them, pull them out of the ground, uh, you know, trim the leaves down to about two inches and then store them in some slightly damp sawdust or sand, kind of in, you know, your root cellar or basement or kind of a, a dark, cool place over the winter. And then in the spring, when the, the ground is ready to be worked, then you can put them back into the ground and, and then they'll, they'll grow and, and produce flowers and seeds for that season. And some of you that have long season or even just start things early, like I do, sometimes you will get seeds that same season. Like I have done that with carrots, I've done that with onions, where I will get seeds, viable seeds that same year. So don't give up and think, oh, this is too hard. I'm going to store it forever. Sometimes all you need is a longer season and that'll work or just luck i guess <laughs> all right so how to check for viability we talked about sterile seeds this um is something that as you get going with your seed library the longer you're doing it the more you should start thinking about this because you start to get seed that gets old or people that say it's old or people that are just thinking thinking that it can't be me it can't be my gardening it has to be that the seeds were bad and so i check i, I actually usually have volunteers check um, seed, uh, seed uh, germination rates by doing this method. So there are several other methods. There are about four or five different ways you can do it. I think this is one that's easiest for me um, because it's something that I can, that, that takes up less room and um, I can keep labels better on it. But essentially take a paper towel and a spray bottle or a cloth if you don't use paper towels, a thin cloth, and get it wet, spray it, or first put the seeds on if if you um, if you don't want to be touching it and afraid that the, if they're small enough seeds that they don't they come off with wet hands or the wet that wet towel then just wait and just put it all on your dry paper towel um, and then put it down in in a grid of a hundred seeds because you're going to do it by percentage right the germination is going to be by percentage if you don't have a hundred seeds that's totally fine do 10 20 however you want to divide it so that you can make it into a percentage it's up to you. Um, once you get that down, then make sure all the seeds are moist. And then usually with, I use paper towels. Now I'll fold them over or put another paper towel on top of them and spray that down so that they're nice and wet. And then I slip it into a Ziploc bag and either put it on a, a warming mat or in a warm house. Or we have actually our main seed library here in Flagstaff is in the county extension office, which is always super hot. So we just leave them out on, on tables and desks. Um, anyway, with that, we leave them there and then just keep checking every few days. Some seeds take some longer to germinate, and it just depends on how warm the seeds are. So don't give up on them right away, but take the time to, um, to give it at least um, three to four weeks for some seeds um, to see what your germination rate will be. And then just keep checking them, make sure that they're staying wet, and then see if you have things that are germinating. And then, of course, label and keep good records. I keep them on spreadsheets because um, otherwise I forget. What did we do last time, last year, or the year before that um, for germination on such and such variety? So keep good records. I think your germination rate's going to be just the number that germinated over the number you started with. Yes, thanks for that critical piece. The other thing you can do is, this is supposed to remind me, this is um, uh, a greenhouse in Boulder, Utah uh, that uh, farm to table restaurant, it feeds the restaurant, and um, just plant the seeds out and see what you get. And the number that germinate over the number that you planted. And this is, it's also a fun thing to do with kids. For those of you that have an education component with your seed library, um, not even just kids, but adults, ours is, is ran by the Master Gardener Association here in our county. And they love these kind of things that a lot of the volunteers want to do it because it's a fun project. And kids are the same way. There's a school right next, uh, a Title I school right next to our seed library too. And they love to come to the seed library and do things like this. Just double check the records. All right, you. All right, so storing seeds. Um, you know, the, the rule of thumb is three things. You want them to be cool, dry, and dark. Uh, and if you, you meet those conditions, you know, you can store seeds for, for a long period of time. Uh, containers can be used, clay, glass, plastic, paper. Um, you know, if you're going to put them in, in non-breathable containers like glass or something like that, that's where it's crucial 
uh, that, that you get them dry enough so that they don't start to mold in there. We, you know, when we first started out, I think we had quite a few that started molding just because we didn't dry them well enough. Um, you know, you want to store them in a cool, dark, dry place, less than 80 degrees. You know, it says 22% relative humidity here. If it's dry, that, that, that's all that matters. Um, you know, if you're really concerned about them and you want to put them into colder storage, you know, um, you can always put them in your refrigerator or your freezer. Um, if you've got, you know, a, a cool basement or a root cellar, those are all great locations to store them. Um, the colder the storage, essentially, the longer that they're going to last. Um, you'll see, and we've got some charts in here, you know, of seed longevity. Um, but you can always extend that by just storing them colder. Uh, I wouldn't recommend putting your seed collection in the trunk of your car if you live in Phoenix or Las Vegas or, or anywhere for that matter, just because it gets so hot in there. You know, that's one one way that you're going to um, have have your seeds go bad and not not germinate or, or you know reduce germination rate than they could be. Oh, and I just saw a couple of questions really quick about this. So um, germination rate by the USDA standards uh, for seed companies, they only have to be 55% uh, germination positive, I guess. <laughs> the rates have to only be really that low. And so I still put seeds out um, if they're anything anything below 90% uh, or 80%. I'll usually leave, leave a tag on it or, and I'll overpack. I'll say this is overpacked because our germination rates were low. I think I, actually, I think I do 70%. Okay? If it was lower than 70%, then I'll add extra seeds. Uh, or and leave a little caution note on the on the at the label. And there was another question about squash, I think, and cucumbers crossing. And those um, those do not cross. Uh, cucumbers are in the genus Cucumis, and so it, they're not close enough to cross. They will cross with each other, different varieties of cucumbers. Good to know. Um, Seed storage for for library use. Um, I think everyone's familiar with this picture. This is the uh, the, the quote unquote doomsday vault in Svalbard, where the you know the goal is to have the world seed collection in there in case of some sort of catastrophic climate event. Um, you know, interesting idea. Um, I, I think a better way is in the hands of people to save seeds and store seeds because we're continuing to plant them out. We're continuing to evolve those varieties. They're continuing to adapt to the changing climate world that we live in. Um, you know, just storing them away for, for many, many years in anticipation of a climate event that eventually occurs and then going back and fishing those seeds out, they've not been able to adapt to those climate changes. And so they may not, you know, at that point in time, may not be viable or germinate. Uh, but, you know, other ways of storing them at home, um, seed library drawers, cupboards, you know, it's really popular to get the old uh, library card catalogs and store them in there. Um, living seed banks, like I mentioned, just in the hands of people. Um, you know, having seed swaps and trading seeds with, with fellow gardeners, seed librarians, seed uh, aficionados. Um, you know, just keeping that flow of seeds alive and, and keeping them being planted and cultivated um, are all great ways to, to save and store seeds. Right yeah, okay. Speed it up a little. Yeah. So one of the questions, and I think it's been asked, is you know, how long can seeds be stored? And and the real answer is we really don't know. Um, you know, I'm a person who likes stories, so here's another story. Uh, and I think this is a, a really great example of um, how long seeds can be stored. This this image here is from a dig site uh, in Israel by the Dead Sea called Masada. And they did the excavations of the site in uh, the, the mid-1960s. And, and in there, they discovered pots that had Judean date palm seeds in there. The Judean date palm was was huge, you know, uh, back in, in in ancient Israel. Where there were you know plantations of them around Jericho and the Dead Sea, and they were prized as the best, uh, sweetest dates, big plump dates. They stored for a long time and medicinal properties to them. So they're heavily sought after, and they were a large part of the agricultural economy in Israel. Uh, you know. Two, three, four, five thousand years ago. I think records going back to five thousand years is when they started to cultivate them. Uh, over the years of, of war and, and conquering, uh, those plantations were destroyed. Uh, but in the 1960s, they discovered some seeds in this dig. And sadly enough, what happened was that those seeds uh, found their way into a professor's drawer, and they they stayed in his drawer for uh, almost uh, 
50, 60 years. Uh, it was in uh, 2005 when he had passed away and somebody had found them in this death store and said, hey, we should try to do something with these seeds. And so they started with four seeds and they, they planted them. Nobody thought that they would germinate. Um, and they didn't do anything special to the meter. They treated them with a little bit of rooting hormone just to try to <clears> encourage <throat> them to, uh, to germinate. And of those four, one of them did germinate. Um, and it, it, um, they named it Methuselah. Now, date palms are male or female. So you have to have a male plant and a female plant to be able to produce dates. And so they thought, great, um, you know, he grew and, you know, we determined that he's a male, we named him Methuselah, and uh, this is Methuselah today in, in Israel on display. And they thought, but, you know, it's so old, it's never going to actually do anything, it's never going to produce any pollen. And lo and behold, a few years after it germinated and was growing, it started to produce pollen. And they said, okay, great, let's try to see if we can pollinate another date variety with it. And they were able to pollinate another date variety, now a modern, more modern cultivar, but it produced dates. Um, at that same time, people were going through different dig sites and collections, and, and more date palm seeds were discovered. And so there was a total of 32 date palm seeds that, that had been discovered, and all of them uh, were planted. And of those, six of them, including Methuselah, six of them germinated. Uh, and some of them were females. So one of the females that germinated, they named Hannah. And Hannah eventually did start to produce flowers. And they they, produ they were able to produce Judean dates. And um, this was the first time in, in, in probably 2,000 years that somebody had eaten Judean dates. Okay. Um, but the seeds, when they did the carbon data on these seeds were 2,000 years old. So it it... it Kind of is is that you know it was stored in the right conditions you know cold dry dark conditions that they were found in um, and it's just a great story of we don't know how long seeds really do last if they're stored in the right conditions you know you'll, you'll see charts that say you know um, beans are good for three years beets for five years uh, and, and so forth and that doesn't mean that all of a sudden at that time point, there's programmed death in those seeds that the, the beet seed wakes up one day and looks at his watch and says, yep, it's been five years, I'm done and I'm out and I'm not going to germinate anymore. Um, but when stored under the right conditions, um, what you may see is you may see at five years, maybe you see a reduction in germination rate uh, if you store them just at room temperature. But if you store them in the right conditions, you know, again, dry, dark, cold, you put them in your freezer or something like that, you may find that you get 90%, 95% germination of beet seeds 10, 12, 20 years down the road. Uh, we really don't know how long they last. And this is why we do these germination tests to see what is the germination rate. Um, these are good rules of thumb for if they're stored at you know, room temperature conditions. Um, and again, it's not like you're going to get zero germination out of these when they're past these times. You're going to get reduced germination. Yeah, I mean, for example, onions always the lowest one, and people say, I throw out my onion seeds every year. Well, I'm still using the same onion seeds for the seed library I got five or six years ago, and for my garden, I haven't had any problems. Yeah. Um, just really quick, we're all into seed libraries right now, and, and if you haven't checked out Cindy Connor's book, Seed Libraries, and you might look into it. It was one of the things I picked up in 2014, 2015, and this is a good quote I love from it. A seed library is an institution that lends or shares seed. It is distinguished from a seed bank in that the main purpose is not to store or hold seeds against possible destruction, but to disseminate them to the public, which preserves the shared plant varieties through propagation and further sharing. So that's all our hope, right? That we will be able to share seeds. Um, this is what originally we started with here in Flagstaff at our seed library, which were just a couple things in the extension office. Um, but just, just the idea, the ideal is that people borrow seeds, they return seeds, but that doesn't always happen, right? I mean, that's not something that we're always going to be, be perfect at. So let's just talk about a few things. Um, we've already kind of talked about this. What's the worst thing that happens when our seeds cross as we're saving seeds? People still get to eat them, um, but then we know maybe we need to get a new zucchini seed the next year, a new summer squash. Um, it's worth a try, right? Um, the other thing is, is that we can't do it as seed librarians alone. We have to really work at inspiring and encouraging our patrons to save at least one variety. And then find, think outside the box and find creative ways to um, instill this ownership in them. 
We do um, seed saving classes, we seed starting classes. We um, encourage people if they're really excited about a specific variety of seed um, to grow it out and return some to share or to share the stories. Um, it's really cool to see my, I was never really good about saving na native uh, plant seeds, but so many other of, of the volunteers at the seed, like we all do it volunteer, right? Um, so many of the, the volunteers there got really excited about a lot of native native plants. And so now we are getting this huge collection of native plants on top of our vegetables and fruit and herb seeds. So um, instill that ownership and in, emphasize the importance of, of the reporting of seeds. We don't always know what we get when we come in. We can still use those seeds. They can be things that we um, offer free uh, or put out in the community as just maybe some promotional stuff. So even when we get seeds that we might not want to put in our seed library, if we decide that they're not to, the, to what our mission and our standard of our seed library is, there are other things we can do those. But, but above all, encourage people and the desire to get out and try. I think once you decide what your mission of your seed library is, then you meet that. Our mission is to get people growing, especially because the seed library is in a very uh, low income area and we want people growing their own food so they can be more sustainable. That's our number one priority. The gravy has been how many of these varieties that have come into the library that are have hundreds of years of history and to be able to preserve those and, and to be a steward of those is, is just another huge added bonus. And then other advice I would give is to only take on what you can do and don't overwhelm yourself. I didn't make a huge, beautiful website. I still have it. It's been operational for what, six years now. Um, we have a Facebook page and even that I'm not very good at advertising, but the word of mouth gets out, but that's what I have time for. And other people start to make it a passion and they start to, to offer their expertise. So those kind of things kind of, you put them out there and they come forward back to us. Here's some great resources of books if you don't have these already, um, but I will draw your attention to the last one, Google it. We all have so many questions per variety of what to save and how to save it. Um, just look up some things and start finding the information you need. But these are all books that I have in my personal library. And then I've also, we've also built up the seed libraries and um, seed saving one to also encourage people to check those out um, and to save seeds for the seed, li seed library for themselves. I think that might be it. And so I know we have questions. Oh, and yeah. And then I would love to hear people, if we have time, I would love to hear people's struggles or hesitations about saving seeds for their seed libraries. Francis, do we have any uh, questions we haven't already answered? Yeah, I do have a couple. Um, right. sh should seed envelopes, like the paper ones, be stored themselves in airtight containers if kept in a library cupboard? So um, I would I would emphasize that seeds are still living organisms, right? So I saw there was also an, a question about silica, so I'll answer that yeah. at the same time. Um, these are still, they're dormant, they're, they're babies all packaged up. So we want to be able to, to not make them completely airtight and, and also completely dried out. So um, you can use different kind of materials. Most people don't, people don't really like plastic. Um, I'm okay with it because these things, my idea is that, they're, that their turnover should be high enough that I'm not going to store for 100 years my seeds in plastic. Um, but paper is okay. I actually store a lot of seeds in paper. I know a lot of seed companies and people that do. Um, glass is great. A lot of people use clay, clay pots. I mean, we've throughout history, that's been what, what we've used, right, as, as human beings. Anything you want to add to that? You probably have something. Don't use desiccation packets. Yeah, you don't want to dry them out too much. Yeah. Um, I have another question regarding um, the information. What do you feel is critical information that should be attached to each set of each set of seeds in a seed library? That's a great question, and and I've always struggled with this um, because it, it I think it's also local specific. Like, do you need them to know how long to expect it to germinate and when when to give up? For me, it's um, I like to put a little bit of the history of where the seed came from. I like the days of maturity. Um, what, what the variety is. You could also talk about companion planting. What you could, I mean, there's so much information you can conclude. So I just put enough that I make sure I have the days to maturity and that because that's so important when we live in cold climates here where we are. Um, 
and then just a little bit of information about it. And usually the color. Um, those are all, all the ones I mentioned are things I can put in if I have time. If not, then I also put dividers that have more information. And you can also use your website. You can use links. Um, just put what you can do, right? Because you could keep going forever. I think you usually also put information on it, like is this a direct sow in the ground versus you yeah, just started exactly. indoors and how many weeks before you know it's ready to be planted outside and you just started indoors. A good clue is just to look at some seed packets you could purchase. And when you start seeing what they included, then decide what you might think is best. So uh, Bonnie has a, a struggle that she'd like to share. Um, her struggle is getting people to return seeds that they harvest or donate non-hybrid, non-patented seeds. Uh, they can't afford to keep buying seeds themselves. Do you have any ideas to encourage patrons to return seed? That really is the number one struggle, I think, of all seed libraries, is, is just getting seeds returned. Um, I would suggest finding your core group that you can count on to help you grow out seeds every year and just count, just, just build up that core group until you have reliable um, donations coming in. I struggle with this too. And especially because I used to grow out all the seeds and 85% and of the seeds myself and put them in, but then we moved. And then I was behind and we've had to buy seeds and that's okay, you know, do what you can do. Um, you know, if you're buying seeds where you where is a good source to get seeds from or, um, or if you, or which seed companies to ask um, for seeds. A lot of these smaller seed companies, they're so generous. They love to donate um, to causes and so, Find those core people that can help you, whether they're in the seed industry or they're your friends or your colleagues. Um, go to Master Gardener Associations, ask them. Go to local farmers, ask them. Go uh, think outside the box of people that you can get reliable seed from and start there. I think education is a big part too. I think like what, like once a year we give a seed saving talk to the Master Gardener yeah. Association. You know, we've done a number of seed saving talks at the seed library itself, and it's amazing to see how many people always show up to those. I think a, a lot of the struggle with getting people to return seeds is just this fear of it's just too hard and I'm going to mess things up and just trying to educate them and get them to the point of, hey, it's not hard to do. It's easy to do. Start with, you know, one variety or something like that and, you know, just be able to learn and go from there. And another part of that question is don't so worry so much about the hybrid. All you have to do is put on the label, this is a hybrid seed. The GMO, I, I would watch Bill's thing. I'm not very good at, at being too careful with that, and I really should. Um, but because we, we know that most of that seed is going to big corporations and not us little people, I don't worry as much. Um, but the hybrid thing, just label it hybrid. Let people know, because at least you're getting them growing, right? You're filling up your seed library with seeds that 95% of, of those people aren't going to return anyway. So at least you're getting them growing and they're getting confident. And if they do save seeds, they might come up with a really cool variety the next season. Who knows? The only, the only thing to be aware of in, in danger with saving hybrid seeds is there's a lot of intellectual property protection on hybrid seeds. So um, you, you could find yourself getting into some trouble saving hybrid seeds because you're not supposed to per the law. And that's the one thing to watch out for. Yeah. And after what, seven generations, then you're okay. But yeah. Okay. Never mind. He knows more about intellectual property than I do. That would that would be the only concern with, with putting hybrid seeds in the seed library. Any other ones, Francis? Um, I actually don't see any more. There's just some commentary. Um, somebody gave a suggestion um, with putting like minimal information on seed packets. Um, and putting them in a binder so that they can have the information with planting, uh, you know, planting tips and the seed history with it. Great. I do have a question. Sure. Um, should our goal to be, be to uh, develop a self-sustaining seed library rather than try to or order the seeds from a seed company? I think it's entirely up to you. Come up with your own mission. Like I started a seed library before I knew anything about saving seeds much. I, I, well, I think a lot of us come into it because we are hoarders with seeds. And so I had so many seeds and I saw a seed library and I got really excited and I didn't know anything about how to start a seed library. And so our mission became to get more growers 
And so come up with your own idea of what your goal is and your mission and stay true to that. And so if it is to have pure local seeds, then stay, stay to that. You know, grow out those seeds and make that the priority. For me, the priority is just getting more growers and people growing food. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, but you know, it, that is ideal, right? Like if we could all be self-sustaining right. in our seed library. And, right. and you know, we keep, we keep preaching, we keep preaching this, right? We're all seed evangelists. And at some point, um, people will, will understand how important it is. And then I think we'll be able to, to get that. And I'm seeing that after six years, I'm starting to see more people see how important it is. So don't give up. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll do that. I have a question as well. I was curious, when you initially started, how did you determine which seeds to include? Did you have limitations on that? Or, I mean, it seems like I want everything, but I know that that's not necessarily a good place to start. Well, I stand by my, we're all seed hoarders, right? Yes. So, um, <laughs> so I started with ones I had an excess of that I wanted to share. And then I tried to stay small, but I was like you, like, look at all the pretties. And so go back to that original advice, like, do what you can do and stick to it. I know some seed libraries that only offer 25 different varieties and they're good at always having those available. So, so do what you can and, and pick the ones that are going to be the most, either that you have the most availability to or the ones you think will be um, accepted the most by, um, by your community. Great, thank you. Best of luck. All right, well, we're a little over time, but we're willing to stay on if anybody else has other questions. I have a question. Um, I'm calling I'm from California, but I'm trying to start a seed library from scratch. I met with the librarian um, before the COVID, so everything came to a stop, and I've been researching, uh, educating myself on how to do it. I'm so thankful for both of you for sharing your knowledge and experience. And I'm really trying to push it so I can get that library um, seed library. There's two and two other libraries, but this particular one does not have one. So um, I think that the information I got, there's a lot of different ways. Um, I, I'm a master gardener, so I think I can tap into their resources to help um, educate people on how to start a garden from seed. So I'm starting from scratch, really from scratch. So um, yeah. there's nothing, um, I'm, I'm just trying to educate myself so see how I can get people involved. If you said tap into the people you can depend on to get get things up and running. But right now it's yeah. just me in a library. So I, I hope that in a few years that it'll be up and running. I'm gonna, there's the other libraries that have been, see libraries been established two years. I'm gonna try to do a, a Zoom to have people teach them how to save seeds and how to start a garden from seeds. And that'll be wearing my master gardener hat if you know so um i hope that i can still help other libraries that are established plus uh, maybe they can help with um recruiting to help with uh, starting the the seed library where i want to start it so i want to thank you i just had to make a Great. comment i'm just starting from scratch well you're welcome and yes starting from scratch is okay that's what we did yeah. we started from scratch so, so you can get there and I actually had a hard time getting the public uh, book libraries to get on board. And it isn't until this year, six years later, that they have one. Another option, too, that I'm, that I'm really excited to see, especially with COVID, are just little seed libraries, right? Like little kiosks. People are, are, are giving and being generous with their seeds. So sometimes those of you that can't get into a location, try that. See if someone will just put up a little box for you and you can start filling that up. And the Master Gardener Associations are great. They're the ones who funded it from the beginning. Yeah, they were really on board and they said, great, Jackie, go for it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, best of luck. Thank you. Yes. Um, 
Well, uh, we could wrap up if it is, unless anyone else would like to share or. I think the next session is, do we have a lunch break? Is that what, or is the next session at, a, at 12 specific time? I think we have a one hour break. Okay. Between right, well, this, this session and the next session. Okay. Well, I'm happy to answer any other questions uh, for the next five minutes or, or we can wrap up. Hi, can you show the last slide that has the books? Where they yeah. the slide the slide before the last slide. And thank you. This was very informative. I'm glad it was helpful. It's a very exciting thing to do. And and those of you that are starting, be warned, you're getting to something you're going to be obsessed about. <laughs> Steve laughs because it's an understatement. It's more than an understatement. Sometimes I think my kids should sleep outside just so I have more room for seeds. We, we joke that the master gardener class is the cheapest, most expensive class ever because of what happens afterward. I think I would have come to it anyway. It, mm -hmm. it was, that's what I went to school for were plants and animals. All right, well, Thank you everyone and thank you to Frances. She's the rock star at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance who helps us all stay on task. And she jumped in without me even asking her to help with um, the chat. And, and I appreciate that so much because I didn't expect so many people to come. So thank you all for being here. And my information um, is available, I think through, well, you can go on Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance to get my information if you have any other questions. I'm always having happy to help anyone that wants to start a seed library. And if I don't know, then I always rope Steve into it to helping too. So thanks everyone. Bye-bye.